Welcome to Newcastle Family History Society podcasts. The Newcastle Family History Society, located on a Wabakal land in Newcastle, New South Wales, Australia, provides support for those interested in family history. Just getting started in family history or need a bit of a refresher on what to do, then this podcast series is definitely for you. Long-time society members, Marie and Ken Schilling will, in six episodes, give some insights into genealogical research, starting with the very first steps and moving on in succeeding episodes to cover topics such as what's in a name, putting flesh on the bone and how did they get here. Marie and Ken have researched their own families for over 35 years and are the authors and compilers of many Newcastle Family History Society publications. Their combined knowledge and experience will, no doubt, provide a rich resource for those delving into family history. So, you have become interested in your family's story and are wondering how and where to find out more? Perhaps we can help with the exciting journey you are about to undertake. You can expect to experience a full range of emotion from frustration at a hidden ancestor or shock at finding a criminal to elation when a piece of the jigsaw falls unexpectedly into place. But perhaps we should have placed a health warning at the top of this talk due to the addictive nature of the work. You'll find that solving one question invariably opens the door to another. So you can never say your family's story is really finished as seemingly more and more resources are becoming available on a daily basis and who knows, a newly discovered source might just help you uncover that elusive ancestor. You will gain many new skills as you progress your family research, such as increasing your computer skills through copying documents and editing photographs, finding locations for appropriate resources, improving interviewing techniques and organising your material. Now to get started. You might be excited at the prospect of finding when your family's name first entered the history books, or if indeed your great-grandfather really did marry four times, but genealogists with many years of experience recommend that you start with yourself. How often have we heard comments such as, that I'm not an important person, or there's nothing special about me? Imagine for a moment that you are your descendant, living a hundred years from now. Wouldn't you be thrilled to find a shopping list from 2023? Or tickets for the wonderful concert given in October of that same year in Newcastle by Paul McCartney, a member of the famous Beatles? So, start by making a list of the important events in your life, such as your birth, when and where you started school, your first job, and how much you were paid death of a parent or grandparent, etc. But don't forget happenings in your local community which you may have witnessed, such as the Pashabalka storm of 2007 or the Newcastle earthquake in 1989. This list of events can be turned into a story at a later date. Make copies of certificates such as your birth, school, music or sporting awards and take photographs of any medals, trophies or indeed of any object of special significance to you. For example, your residence, your car, or your pet. If you have a stored collection of photographs, cards, or letters that may have been handed down to you, give them an airing, and try to attach names, places, and dates, if not already labelled. You should now think about repeating the process of gathering information and photographing objects for each member of your immediate family. Try to involve them as much as possible, as that could lead to the beginning of a shared interest in your family's story. An interesting exercise is to take a walk through your home, room by room, to check if there's an heirloom tucked away somewhere for safekeeping. People often leave more than a paper trail behind them, and it is the simple, everyday object which Grandma used in her kitchen or Grandpa kept in his shed that helps add a personality to your ancestor. It might be a poor item in monetary terms, 
but very rich in adding an aspect to your family's story. The artefact itself might offer further information. For example, an article of clothing such as a wedding dress could indicate a time period and possibly reveal an ancestor's physique. Or a piece of furniture might point to a remarkable skill at the hands of a forebear. Jewellery might show an engraved name or initials. Letters, diaries, autograph books and postcards offer tell of the owner's life and times and may carry interesting signatures. Books can sometimes have inscriptions written on the inside cover, giving the name of the donor as well as the reason for the gift. It may have been a Bible presented at a baptism or carried at a wedding, or a fictional work selected by the recipient as a school prize. Perhaps an old school book might have been kept showing an ancestor's artwork or mathematical calculations, or, better still, a report card with some revealing comments. Family heirlooms exist in a surprising number of forms, and holding something that ties you to a distant forebear can be a moving experience. For family historians, it is what the object tells us about an ancestor that is so significant and exciting. The monetary value is of little importance. At this point, it is probably time to think about just what you want to research. Is it to prove or dispel a family myth? or perhaps to trace one of your family names as far back as possible. Taking a scattergun approach to the whole of your ancestry would probably result in frustration, with data overwhelming you. So set a reasonable goal. Taking small bites of the cherry, one at a time, is the way to go. You also need to decide how and where you will store your information in a systematic way. It is surprising at how quickly names and dates will be gathered along with little pieces of information hurriedly scrawled on bits of paper. So being organised from day one of your family history search is most important. There is no best way of organising research material. Each person must select a method that works for them and be easy enough for others to follow later when they are no longer around. A system can be as simple as using a ring binder for each family name or a separate file for every individual, which is placed inside a filing cabinet. If you are happy using a computer, you might decide to establish a file for each family, but please remember to regularly back up your files. We sometimes hear of people losing a lot of their research through forgetting this important step. If you intend doing a lot of family research, it could be an idea to have a dedicated laptop which would leave your main computer free and be easy to carry all your family research as you visit relatives or libraries. One other aspect to be considered before you launch into full research mode is the storage of special documents and photos. You might have an actual family portrait, artwork or original certificate handed down to you which you, as family custodian, are responsible for. If possible, Take a copy of it for use at family gatherings or in the family story you might want to write. Then place the original item into storage in acid-free paper. Your descendants will thank you for keeping the link with the past so safely. Organising your family history research can take some effort, but if you have an efficient system, you will never look back. Once you are satisfied that you have collected as much information and as many resources as possible from home, the next step is to contact members of your extended family who might be able to help you fulfil your goal. Oral history can play a very important part in your family history search through hearing stories from relatives about ancestors you may never have known. If you have arranged to interview a relative, it is good to have a short list of pertinent questions, 
but always be ready to listen and follow the line of thought, even if it means discarding most of your questions. Sometimes interesting light might be thrown on grandma's character or great-grandfather's vices if you allow the conversation to flow easily. However, talking with older relatives may not be quite as easy as you would think. Some topics could provoke painful memories, so you would need to steer the conversation quickly onto a lighter topic. Taking a few photographs or small objects with you might make that task a little easier. It also pays to remember that while older people can often recall events, places and dates can sometimes be confused. Talking can be tiring for the elderly, so you might have to arrange a second visit. It's more important for the interview to be enjoyed by both you and your subject rather than having you push for as much information as possible on the one occasion. The aim is for a relaxed conversation, not an interrogation. If the person being interviewed is willing, take a photo of them. Or better still, ask a third person to photograph both of you together. And when you get home, send them a copy. They might also have family photos or objects such as a Bible, which they would be willing to let you photograph. It could contain a list of family names written on the first page or two with relevant birth, marriage or death information. It was not unusual for people to keep their family's vital information that way in times past. If you want to record an interview, make sure you have permission to do so. It is advisable to transcribe it as soon as you can while it's still fresh in your mind. For example, should a portion of your recording be drowned out by talk and laughter from other people in the house or a noisy kookaburra announcing his presence, your recall might be able to fill in the distorted portion of the interview. It's also a nice gesture to send a thank you note in some form to the person who kindly shared their memories with you. If you want to contact a relation who lives quite some distance away, elderly people would probably prefer a written letter, while those of a younger generation would be happy to receive an emailed contact. No matter which method you choose, the basic guidelines are the same. Introduce yourself briefly to establish you do have a family connection. State the help you are seeking and ask if they would be willing to receive further communication from you to that end. If they agree, in any following correspondence, you should try to offer some information or images you have been able to find. This establishes a win-win situation a happy arrangement for both parties. It is important to always reply to letters or emails even if you have had a negative response. A good piece of advice is to keep a record of your contacts and their addresses. You may wish to get back in touch when you find new evidence of an event or your family story. Your extended family includes not only the older relatives, of course, but those of your own generation and younger. You could find that some cousins may not be at all interested in family history, while others might be only too willing to help with your quest. Some people might not have the time to talk about ancestors due to work commitments, and others might not wish to find out about the inevitable skeleton in the family's cupboard. We all have them tucked away somewhere be it illegitimacy, bigamy, divorce, murder, or some other crime. If finding something like this might be a cause for concern, then perhaps you had better keep your ancestral skeleton lying quietly undisturbed. In conclusion, we offer these seven golden rules which experts and beginners alike should bear in mind when researching their family's story. 1. 
Set your goal realistically, hasten slowly. Two, organize a recording and storage system. Three, work backwards through the generations, starting with yourself. Four, be honest. Don't cover up or embellish information. Five, talk to as many relatives as possible and compare their stories. Six, verify events such as births, deaths and marriages. 7. Keep records of appropriate places visited and people interviewed. In the next podcast in this series, we will investigate places to visit and how that can help you unlock more of your amazing story. Thanks for listening to this podcast, and we hope you found Marie and Ken's tips useful. You can always get help and assistance at the Newcastle Family History Society's library in Elder Street, Lambton. Perhaps consider becoming a member. Check out our website, www.nfhs.org.au for details. Be sure to listen in again to the wonderful world of genealogy on Newcastle Family History Society podcasts.